to Psalm 3. <clears throat> Psalm 3. <clears throat> or you could call it the third Psalm. Now don't get these numbers confused up here. It's not uh, the 25th Psalm. It says this is the 25th. This seemed like an awful big long semester. <clears throat> oh, is that what it is? Are these numbers all connected with that? Maybe so? Okay. All right. What we're going to do from now on until <clears throat> the end of this semester is we're going to deal with psalm, the s different psalms that have a historical connection. Okay. Now, how do we know which ones do? Well, for the most part, for example, Psalm 3, some of your Bibles, if you look above before it says, you know, Psalm 3 and goes into it, Mine says a, a morning psalm. I don't know anybody say that. And then, then it says a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. All right, so what we're going to be doing from the rest of this time is we're going to be dealing with different psalms that have a historical connection and that is something that we can refer back to in Samuel or Kings or Chronicles or something like that. And it's a very interesting uh, way of searching the scriptures because... In the Psalms, the way we've been looking at it, we've simply been trying to find the spiritual meaning. But what we're going to find now is that we're going to find David's words or the psalmist's words um, in light of a situation. In other words, we're going to see them in real life. We're going to see what they're thinking behind the scenes. We're going to see what they're going through behind the scenes. Does that make sense? I mean, this is because these are all, these psalms were written during actual events, okay? And so, um, before we, why don't you mark your place there in Psalm 3? Before we get into that, let's look at the historical account from which drew this psalm out. And it's over in 2 Samuel chapter 15. And, of course, it told us that <clears throat> this was uh, the occasion for this was the rebellion of, of uh, Absalom. Well, Absalom is David's son, and this is a psalm of David. So <clears throat> these are actual events. <clears throat> um, Second uh, Samuel, uh, what did I say? 15, 15, 14. And really, we probably should read, uh, well, let's just look at verse, uh, verse 14 here. And David said unto all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, for we shall not else escape from Absalom, Make speed to depart, lest he overtake us suddenly and bring evil upon us and smite the city with the edge of the sword. So David's own son has risen up against him, okay, and is trying to overthrow him as king and is trying to take over his position. Now, to get, to get uh, some of this, let's look in chapter 14, beginning with verse 25. We'll read 25 and 26. This is 2 Samuel 14. But in all Israel there was none <clears throat> to be so much praised as Absalom for his beauty. Oh, my, my, my. From the sole of his foot even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. Man. What do, what do we call that nowadays? A hunk? <laughs> no blemish. Verse 26. And when he cut the hair of his head, for it was, at, it was at every year's end that he cut it, because the hair was heavy on him, therefore he cut it. He weighed the hair of his head at 200 shekels after the king's weight. So not only was he good looking, not only was he unblemished, but he had the hair. And, you know, having the hair is a big deal. And so, um, let's see. What are, Absalom represents one who is perfect outwardly. David 
was perfect inwardly, but he had lots of flaws outwardly. You know, I mean, where does the scripture say God looks upon the outward appearance, or on the heart, but man looks upon the outward appearance? Okay, so now let's go ahead and we'll just get into chapter 15 here. Verse 1, And it came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. Um, wow. I mean, he really believes in looking good, looking impressive. I wrote, Absalom prepared to overthrow David because he didn't like the way the king treated him. Now, it wasn't that he didn't like the way his father treated him, but he didn't like the way the king treated him. Now, the king was his father, but he didn't like the way he was treated. Okay. Now, have you ever been in a situation where you didn't like the way you were being treated? Yeah. So, David, remember, we're going to read this third psalm, and David's in that situation. <clears throat> Um, all the wrongs he pointed out to people, speaking of Absalom, all the wrongs he pointed out to people were not motivated by righting the wrong, but by getting back at David. Now consider that. This, is, this described someone who is so perfect outwardly, but when they get ready to deal with somebody or some situation, he's pointing out David's flaws. But he's not doing it to right the wrong. He's not doing it to fix. He's not doing it to help. He's not, this isn't constructive criticism. This isn't even really in, with any kind of a motivation to remedy the situation because remedying the situation as it stands is not in his heart. Okay? Um, the main thing is he's just trying to get back at David. All right. I don't know if this has ever happened to you. Um, have you ever seen somebody, you know, in Hollywood that's been in movies and very popular and something like that, and they, they uh, come on a talk show, you know, some David Letterman or, you know, one of those guys, and you really see what they're like, how they talk, how they carry themselves, and you just go, oh, my God, you know? I mean... It's like, I mean, I'm thinking of someone in particular right now who in the movies just appeared so, you know, what can you say? I mean, it's the movies, my Lord. And when this person was talking, I was just going, oh, Lord, I got to give it to them. They are a good actor, very good actor, because golly. Um, well, I got news for you. There are people that are very good actors. And there are people that appear really, really good. They know how to do everything right. They, you know, they, they, they know how to say everything right. And there are other people who really do have a heart for the Lord that may look flaky. And I got news for you. If you're going to follow the Lord, you're going to end up looking flaky quite a bit because God's not interested in how you look to other people. He's interested in working on you. And to work on you means he has to bring stuff to the top. So, you know, that's going to happen. <clears throat> but when we look at Absalom, we see just ugliness on the inside. He's not a, he's not a pretty person. He's an ugly person on the inside. <clears throat> um, and then verse, uh, let's read verse 2. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was that when any man who had a controversy, who came to the king for judgment, and who's the king? David. Then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is, is of one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man de deputed, what is it, yeah, of the king to hear thee. Absalom said, Moreover, O oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man who hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. And it was that when any man came near to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. 
<clears throat> All right, we'll just stop right there. The guy, the guy is smooth. If this was Latin America, we would say he's rico, suave. Okay, he's just smooth, man. I mean, he's he. The first question he asks is, "Where are you from, man?" He's showing him real interest in them personally. Where are you from? Okay. Well, you know, if if you saw a politician like that, you'd say he's a good man. You know, I, I'm not going to tell you the name of the person, but there is a guy who is an anchor for one of the top sh uh, news shows, Nash, in the, you know, the national news. And there's only three stations that have it that I've really liked for years, just in his way and everything. And um, and all of a sudden, when uh, Sarah Palin was interviewed by him, he turned into a monster, a monster. I don't mean, you know, just, I mean a monster. And I went, you know what, I've been deceived by appearances. Because, you know, you wait, wait till you, something disagrees with you. And, and I'm, I'm just going to say this. If you're in the situation of being the national media, folks, you ought to be a good journalist, which means you're unbiased. Okay, that's said, all right. But my point is, is that... Uh, What's in a person is really the most important thing, you know. And you don't see what's in people in the average church setting. You, you come to church, you see them on Sunday, you wave, you hug, you do all that, everybody goes home. It's the system, it's the way of the church world so that nobody gets to see you under a lot of different circumstances. You know what I mean? So that they can see you when you're upset, so that they can see you when you're down and out, so that they can, so that they can get a real impression of what you're like, you know. Hello? That's why some people don't like what's called a total environment. They don't like it because they will be seen for what they are, and they don't want that to show up. And so it's, you know, and folks, it's not fun. But it's, the Lord really uses it. He can, he can grow you up way quicker in a total environment than he can in just, you know, just being in the regular church setting. All right, so Absalom, he flattered people. And you remember it says, and when they were going to do obeisance to him, he would reach over and grab their hand and pull them up, not let them kneel down to him. You're the king's son, and kiss their hand. Oh, my God, Absalom. You look beautiful. You act beautiful. Is there anything better than you? And then he would say, you know, you have a real reason to be upset here. That's what it was basically saying. You have a real reason. You have a real cause. And if I was in charge, I would see that this got dealt with. Okay. So he flattered people and appeared that he cared more than David. And he did appear that he cared more than David. But care is not the issue. Folks, care is not the issue. David was chosen of God. And that's what the issue is. Man, again, looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. David was as flaky a man as you could find. So was Abraham. Folks, Abraham was flaky. Moses was flaky. The question isn't who's the better person. It's not, this is not a democracy, and I'm not talking about this here. I'm talking about, in general, the Christianity, the way the Lord set it up, it's not meant to be a democracy to find the better man. The question is, are you chosen of God? Are you the one God chose? And I will tell you this, when you get in leadership, and particularly when you, you know, you're over a lot of things, Knowing that God did put you in that situation and that, that God did choose you for that task will sure give you a lot of peace when everybody's questioning you. Because you know, and, and I, th this has actually happened, and those who've been around any length of time know, I have actually turned the whole thing over to people who were not chosen, who insisted that they were, could do a better job. And uh, one of those people, I think even Kelly met with recently, who every time you bring up the subject of being a pastor, he feels the rope burns and says, well, I am not a pastor, I was not called to it. And I gave him, I literally turned the whole thing over to the guy. And he ran it for a couple of months and then, you know, saw, my God, I don't have the, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sock of the yes.
<laughs> so it just helps. It helps to be chosen of God. Because then it doesn't matter. And, and let me tell you, one of the, because you do care, one of the things that really gets to you is when you fail. When you fail, it hurts deeply and you want to quit. But you can't because you're chosen. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's good and it's bad all at the same time. It's a two-edged sword. The same edge that cuts them reaches back and cuts you too. But, but if you are chosen, there is grace for you. Do you know what grace is? Do you understand what grace is? Grace is to make it through. Grace is in spite of your failures, in spite of your lack. And that grace is specifically given to you for the task that God has called you to do. Okay? Okay. All right, and then verse 6. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. All right, very powerful statement. I wrote, he stole the hearts of the people. The people saw a kind, a humble, and caring man, but God saw a thief. I mean, that's, he stole. He stole the hearts of the people. God said, you're just a thief. Okay. Isn't it fun to talk about this stuff? But folks, the only thing that matters is real life. All the talking about this stuff means absolutely nothing. What we have to do is hear this stuff and get it in us in such a manner that we can handle real life with it by this stuff because anybody can sit and listen to stuff like this and go, oh yeah, clearly Absalom was a bad person and David was a good one. If you were there then, would you have been fooled by Absalom and his smoothness and his kindness? And would you have thought, you know, David's so busy, I he don't even have time to come down here and make judgments for us and stuff like that. Would you have been, would you have been in this day and time, if you were put in that situation, would you have been sucked in because it looked good and it looked better than him, and well, he's better than him. You know, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right and wrong. Right or wrong, good or evil is off the same tree. It's not a tree for judgment, to judge and determine things. God and godly discernment is the thing. And so, you know, I say this hoping that, you know, Years from now, long after I'm dead and gone, because this, these same incidences come up all the time. This wasn't just a one-time thing here. It'll come up in every generation. It'll come up almost in every church. And my desire is that after I'm long gone, the principle of this will be at work in you so that you don't join with the enemy in the bad side that looks good. You, do you, did you hear what I said? The bad side that looks good. And that's my desire, is that we stay with the Lord, whatever that is. I don't know what that is going to be in the future or whatever, but I know that staying with the Lord is the right thing. And sometimes staying with the Lord means looking bad. In fact, a lot of times, <laughs> you know, actually, if you just be honest over the, the thing, a lot of times it means that, but that's not the issue. The issue is staying with the Lord. When Saul said, did anybody here join, join Christianity, join the Lord in this manner <clears throat> to only go a certain length of time and then drop off, drop away, fall away? Did anybody do that? No. Every one of us said I want to go all the way with you, Lord. Well, this is a hurdle. It's a hurdle that you'll face. And Absalom is going to, uh, and of course, what we don't have here when all this is going on, we don't have, we don't have a record of David running down there to the gate and, and starting kissing everybody's hand too. Isn't that, I mean, is that interesting to anybody that David isn't like making a play for people. Maybe he's just trying to walk in what God's given him, do what God's called him to do, and trust that everyone else is going to follow the same Lord that he's following. You know? 
He's not down there trying to convince her. He's not, you know, someone say, well, I guess David's just stupid. He didn't know what was going on. <clears throat> you know, I guess he just didn't know Absalom was doing this. I think I got a sneaking suspicion he did. And, but instead of being motivated by that and trying to sway the people through the same means and methods that Absalom's using, he trusted the Lord to deal with the people. <clears throat> All right. Verse 7. Um, and it came to pass after 40 years. That's a lot of hand kissing. <laughs> I could have put that a little different. But anyway, uh, after 40 years that Absalom said unto the king, I pray thee, let me go and pay my vows, which I have vowed unto the Lord in Hebron. So he's about to take over, okay? But he waited. He, he played this thing out for 40 years. All right. Now, let me say this and, and evaluate this for me, if you would, please. Absalom was patient. Patience is a virtue. Think. Think through this. Is any patience a virtue? He was patient to do evil. Oh, no, no, no. Patience to do evil isn't a virtue. No, no, you're still off. You're still wrong. Folks, any patience that does not come from the Lord as our fountain that we produce ourselves is not a virtue. Okay, what, where do you get that from? Well, let's see, the Dalai Lama is patient. You know, Buddhists are patient. You know, they're working on it. I mean, they're really working. I got news for you. I bet you some Buddhists are way more patient than you'll ever be. Okay? Well, is that, so is their patience a virtue? No. no. Why? That's the question right there. The question is why, and the answer is because the thing that makes Christianity different than all other religions is Christ is the source of all of this, and therefore the virtue isn't in the act of patience or love or whatever. The virtue is in that it is from Christ who is the source. Jesus is virtuous. Okay? Yes? Well said. The father is not in love with patience. He's in love with his son. Back in the 60s, I dated this girl named Patience. And I was in love with patience, but not now. I'm in love with Jesus. <clears throat> I'm joking. There was no girl named Patience. <laughs> Deb's going, I don't think I heard that story. Oh, she had my heart. <clears throat> anyway, sorry. Um, so I just think, that, you know, I mean, there's a lot of principles in this stuff. And, and we need to realize that right here in Bible school, being patient isn't good enough. It's not what God wants. It's not what I want. People say, well, you know, Randy wants, us, wants the lamb. Well, that's Jesus. You know, oh, I'm so offended that you would want Jesus. You know, if you just you switch the name, you know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't get it either. <clears throat> anyway. Um, verse 12 and 13. Let's drop down. <clears throat> and Absalom sent for Ahithophel, the Gileonite, David's counselor from his city, even from Gil Gilon, Giloah, while he offered sacrifices. And the conspiracy was strong, for the people increased continually with Absalom. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? Verse 13. And there came a messenger to David, saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. Okay, so this whole thing was a conspiracy. It was not the act of a kind and caring person, right? Okay, did everybody pick it? Yeah, it was part of a plot, but did everybody pick up on that? Apparently not, for the hearts of the men of Israel went after Ab This was a conspiracy. God calls it that. The word of God calls it that. Folks, the majority are going to be sucked in. Make your heart after Jesus. He'll show you the right way. He'll just give you discernment. You know, he'll let you know. 
But it's not going to be discernment based on the outward appearance, I promise you. It's going to be God-given discernment. And that's how you'll know the situation. So um, everyone saw the acts of Solomon, but no one saw the motives. I say no one. The majority didn't see the motives. Motive is everything. I'm telling you, listen to me, you can all write that down. If you don't write it down on paper, write it down in your head. Motive is everything. You can can mess up, but trying to do the right thing for the Lord, and if your heart, because your heart and motive are the same, if your heart is, your motive is right, it's not the same as just going off and doing something wrong. I believe that. I believe that. And I've got plenty of examples from throughout the, the scriptures to prove that. <clears throat> All right, so uh, they didn't see the motive. They only saw the acts. And then, uh, let's see, verse uh, 14 and 15. And David said unto all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, for we shall not else escape from Absalom. Make speed to depart, lest he overtake us suddenly and bring evil upon us and smite the city with the edge of the sword. And the king and his servants said unto the king, Behold, thy servants are ready to do whatsoever my lord the king shall appoint. So his men stand ready to defend David and to stand up for what is right. But David leaves all with Solomon except except whosoever will that would come with him. But he leaves everything with Absalom. I'm, I'm sorry. What, how did I say it? Psalm. Yeah. Um, maybe if I just read it. His men stand ready to defend David and stand up for what is right, but David leaves all with Absalom except whosoever will. That's hard. That's hard. Because the whosoever wills are not going to be very many, but they're going to be really precious. They're going to be so precious because they will actually be making a stand for the Lord. All right, so um, let's go to uh, chapter 16. Lord, help me get through all this too. In verse uh, 20. Let's see. Wait a minute. Let's go to verse 5 first. And when King David came to Bahurim, behold, there came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shammai, the son of Gera. He came forth and cursed continuously as he came. And he cast stones at David and at all the servants of King David and all the men and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And verse 7, And thus said Shemaiah when he cursed, Come out, come out, thou bloody man and thou worthless fellow. The Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead thou hast reigned. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom thy son. And behold, thou art taken in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. <clears throat> all right, now let's read verse 20. Then said Absalom to Ahithophel, who was David's counselor, personal counselor and friend, Give counsel among you what we shall do. And Ahithophel said unto Absalom, and anyway, the point being this. Um, Shemaiah is cursing David. And he's also cursing David's mighty men. And David doesn't do anything about it. Darn But he doesn't. He doesn't. His mighty men don't fully understand everything. I got news for you. David knew what was going on. He knew what he was doing. Now, you've got Shemaiah, who is one of his subjects. And you've got Ahithophel, who is one of his counselors. So I wrote this. People served God under David, but deep down they held grudges. The first opportunity to lash out in a tremendous way, they did it, which is what happened, I believe, what happened with Judas. 
Now, this is only my belief when it comes to Judas, but I believe that Judas had a burr in his saddle over a lot of different things all along, and it finally came to a head, and then he said, you know. So let me just say this. Um, I know that you don't want to turn out like Ahithophel, who was who? He was a mighty counselor and everything. He was also Bathsheba's grandfather. So we kind of can understand why he'd have a problem, except for Bathsheba was very big in the plan of God, even though there were some wrong things done and David repented of it and admitted it. There were some wrong things done. Yes, I've sinned, he said, but God forgave him. And so, um, first of all, just to apply it to ourselves, I'm telling you, man, you may not like this or that or whatever, whether it's here or that. You know, I, I wish everybody could just leave and go somewhere else, and then I could talk to you. So you wouldn't say, he's saying this because it applies here. But I'm just telling you, this is just good, sound wisdom. Don't hold grudges. Because if you do, when the opportunity comes, you're going to be surprised at the monster that comes out of it. I'm just being honest with you. It's just not a good idea anyway. We ought to keep short accounts. We ought to keep everything under the blood. And keep right as much as possible, period. But these two guys really messed up, worse than, you know. And I mean, I think, they, I think in one sense they will go down in the hall of shame because they were so off from the Lord. But the amazing thing is, it is possible to go for years and years and years and years within an organization, within, you know, and yet, oh, I don't like this, well, I don't like that, and, you know, and then you can say, well, I don't like, I don't like this and I don't like that, but I like this, 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 and this, and this, and this, and so we go, oh, well, then you're going to be okay. Don't hold grudges. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how to get any plainer than that. Get it? Get it out, or it's going to fester. You know, it just does. All right. So then David says uh, in uh, chapter 18, let's go to 2 Samuel 18, and uh, verse 5. And the king commanded Joab and Abishai and Ataiah, saying, Deal gently for, for my sake with the young man, even with Absalom. All the people heard when the king gave the captain's orders concerning Absalom. And uh, then verse, down to verse 9. And Absalom met the servants of David, and Absalom rode upon a mule. And the mule went under, a thick, uh, under the thick boughs of a great oak, and his head caught firmly in the oak, and he was suspended between the heaven and the earth. And the mule that was under him went away. And a certain man saw it and told Joab and said, Behold, I saw Absalom hanging in an oak. <laughs> you know, that's got to be tough on his pride is what I'm thinking. He always looked so good. And his hair that was, he was so proud of is the thing that ended up being his downfall, getting him caught in this tree. <clears throat> and, <laughs> um, and let's see. And Joab said unto the man who told him, And behold, thou sawest him, and why didst thou not smite him there to the ground? I would have given thee ten shekels of silver and a belt. God knows I could use a belt. And the man said unto Joab, Though I should receive a thousand shekels of silver in my hand, yet would I not put forth my hand against the king's son? For in our hearing the king charged thee and Abishai and Atiah, saying, Beware that none touch the young man Absalom. Otherwise, I should have wrought falsehood against mine own life, for there is no matter hidden from the king, and thou thyself wouldest have set thyself against me. Then said Joab, I may not tarry thus with thee. And he took three staves in his hand and thrust them through the heart of Absalom while he was yet alive in the midst of the oak. <clears throat> All right. So, did you have your hand up? <coughs> so, he dies. And then um, let's drop on down to, to David mourning over him, verse 29. <clears throat> and the king said, Is the young man Absalom safe? And um, Ahimaaz answered, 
When Joab sent the king's servant and me, thy servant, I saw a great tumult, but I knew not what it was. And the king said unto him, Turn aside and stand. And he turned aside and stood still. Uh, let's see. Let's drop down. Uh, uh, verse 32, And the king said unto the Cushite, Is the young man Absalom safe? And, and the Cushite answered, The enemies of my lord the king and all who rise against thee to do thee harm, be as that young man is. <clears throat> and uh, they're, they're, here's the deal. They're figuring, and this happened with uh, Amasa and others too. They're figuring, all these people are figuring that David's going to be overjoyed when his enemies are killed. Just, they, they really, because that's the way they think. And David fools them every time. He, like when Saul died, he wept, you know, how the mighty are fallen, and, you know, you just listen to him, okay? And so he said all this, you know, and the king was much moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, thus he said, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. <clears throat> all right. There is a wisdom that few understand. Not that I have it down, but I, I think I'm aware of it at least. Aware, not that I possess it, but at least I'm aware of it. And that is, watch what you say with your mouth. I just think, and especially around other people. Okay. There are things that you can say to the Lord that you can't say to people. You with me? There are things that you can say to the Lord that you need to not say to people. David, when he was before the people, was, can I say it, lamb-like? Okay? And I believe that's as it should be because he was the king. He was a leader. He was one that others would draw things from. But when you talk to your father... You can say things that you couldn't say. You can express things that you wouldn't express otherwise. All right. So we've heard the story. Now we're going to hear the expression before God, Psalm 3. All right, so turn to Psalm 3. <clears throat> now this, is, this psalm was written at the same time this whole story happened, all right? You with me? And so... What we're going to hear is David's heart before the Lord now. Why? God is his father. God is the great judge. God is the creator of the universe. God is, you see what I mean? God can handle it. <laughs> Don't defile people. Don't defile people. Okay? Do you have a relationship with God? Well, good. Use it. Use it as a vent. He'll be okay. <laughs> right? All right, Psalm 3. Verse 1. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. So David says Absalom is an, incre an increase of them that trouble him because this is uh, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. So what we get from this is, even though David says to his mighty men, don't kill Shemaiah, let him alone. Maybe the Lord sent him to curse me, right? That's what he says before his mighty men. But what he says before God is many are they that have increased my enemies have increased against me, okay? It's, a, it's not a different reality. It is you can speak on a certain level with God that other people cannot handle. And you will, they have other motives working in them. Now, I'm just going to say it out. They have other motives working in them. And if you say certain things, that's going to justify their wrong motives. Do you hear what I'm saying? I'm telling you a fact. I know this. I know that it's going to justify motives in them that are not right. Okay? And you're not saying what they're getting from what you're saying. So it's best 
just to carry yourself as the lamb before her shearers is dumb. It's better to be at the cross than at the Father in when you're in front of people. It's better for them. If you care anything about people, be careful. <clears throat> All right, verse 2. Um, many are, are they who say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. Now, I'm, how much time do we have left? Okay, so I'm, I'm not too bad. His son said, there is no help for my father in God. Would that hurt? Sure would. The enemies cast down, the enemies, this is his son. The enemies cast doubt to others about David's relationship with God. I wrote <laughs> common tactic. That's just how I wrote it. Common tactic. Since David is known for being of God, the only way to bring him down is to discredit that relationship. That's it. Because he's known so purely by everyone for that relationship. So they got to bring down that. They've got to tear that down and make it look like he doesn't really have a relationship. Many are they who say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. But you see, David was always at the cross. So he wasn't looking for deliverance. And because he wasn't getting it, it was easy for them to come with that conclusion. <clears throat> All right, verse uh, 3. But thou, O Lord are to shield from me my glory and the lifter of my head. <clears throat> um, but he who knows of his relationship is secure. When you know your relationship, then thou, but, 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 but thou, O Lord. Notice the word but. There is no help for him in God, but thou, O Lord, are to shield to me. You are the glory and you lift my head, which means, folks, your head is down many times. It is hung down and in deep sorrow and pain. But it cannot be denied that the Lord is the glory and lifter of your head. If you ever lift it again, it's because of the Lord and only because of the Lord. <clears throat> David, uh, let's say a shield is a defensive weapon. You know, I... I, I you read a lot in the Psalms about the enemies, their teeth being sharp like swords, but you never hear of David saying, oh, Lord, give me a sword. And, and that's in the, most of the time, it's a shield, a defensive weapon until what? Until God moves? Remember what we talked about a lot of times until they fall into the pit that they dug themselves. God doesn't even have to do anything. Okay? <clears throat> but he, let's see, David trusts the Lord to raise his head again someday. All right, verse 4, I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. <clears throat> now remember, David had been driven from Zion. He wasn't in Zion. He wasn't there, but God was hearing him from there as if he was from there, because God is there, and David's heart was there. We always mourn over the loss of the outward. We do because we don't have it on the inward. If you have the real thing, then you don't mourn over the loss of the outward because you've got something already. You're not trying to get it. You're rejoicing in what you've got even though you're not in Zion. David's, David's crying out and God's hearing it from his holy hill Zion. Beautiful. That's the bride. That's beautiful. And then uh, verse... Uh, Let's see. Let me make sure I... Well, I wrote, he was driven from Zion, but God still heard him out of there. Whether he was there or not, God was there. And then verse 5, um, I lay down and sleep. I waked for the Lord to sustain me. And if, if you've ever been in a situation like this, one of the things that is hard to come by is decent sleep. Okay. He can sleep on the run because he's sustained by the Lord. <laughs> I mean, that's a beautiful thing to be able to sleep on the run. Thank God. 
Verse 6, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me round about. Well, I got news for you. There were ten thousands of people who had said this was not, you know, we go, oh, yeah, we say that, you know, and we got two or three people upset with us, and yet we're, uh, you know, we're going through it. He had ten thousands of people who had set themselves against him. And yet he said, I will not be afraid. Why? Well, let's see. Let me make sure I got verse 6 said. There were literally 10,000 of people who went with Absalom. But David wasn't moved by numbers of people, but he was moved by God. May it be so in the real life situations when we leave this classroom. Because when, when, they will come. <clears throat> The 10,000 that rise against David, the 10,000 that ri are his own people, Israel, the ones he had lived for all those years, the one he had spent so much agony before the Lord for them, but they are called enemies now. But I want, to, I, want you to make, I want you to know something. They're called enemies here, but they made themselves enemies, not David. Do you understand? David didn't make them his enemies. I, they made themselves enemies, and that's why they're enemies, you know. And this all, again, goes back to, to motives. <clears throat> Verse 7, we've only got two verses left, and then we're out of here. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. And I wrote, broken teeth means that they have been declawed. David asks for the resurrection because the judgment upon the enemies is past. He says, for thou hast smitten all my enemies. Can you come to a place where you already see the judgment pass before it's, the sentence has been put upon them? Where you see it? You know what I'm, do you understand what I'm saying? Can you believe in the cross? That's where the judgment took place. Yes. Us in the actual story in 2 Samuel um, when Absalom died, it said that there was a great slaughter the day that Absalom died. Then it says, for the battle there was scattered over the face of the country. The wood devoured more people that day than the sword, the wood being the cross. And, um, and Absalom died under the thick boughs of a great oak. And his, his head caught hold of the oak and he was taken up. Amen. And it just, the cross did it. Yeah, in my Bible, I didn't say it, but in mine I had it big oak and I had a circle tree and then the cross or a lot of times in my Bible I'll circle something just draw a little arrow and just make the cross sign right there because it's clearly the cross the cross has come to you even you beautiful Absalom <clears throat> and uh, and so just this this reality of uh, believing in that cross I mean gosh we we preach it we claim we believe in it, but the real place to believe in it um, is when we get in the circumstances and everything is pulling you to do something contrary to the cross. And the, the pressure is tremendous. And just to get some relief, you're, you're, you're in danger of doing something on your own instead of believing in what it is that you, you preach. And it is what every son of God must face. And that's when you get ready to put forth your hand and then you say, I would, I would rather die than violate the very Jesus, the very lamb that I claim that I, I'm following. Because then if I do this, then I am an affront to everything I've ever preached. Now, there will be times when you fail, but then you feel so bad, then you go back and you, you, know, you understand you will probably fail. But because your heart is right, you will go back and you go, I will not do that again by the life of Christ and the grace of God. All right, and then verse 8, salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Do we believe that one? <laughs> thy blessing is upon thy people. And I wrote... Um, he is running. David is on the run. But he trusts that blessing is on his people. Well, who is his people? David and the guys that left with him. 
and yet he, 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 but he's on the run. Is that a contradiction? No, it's not a contradiction. It's what's, what we call faith. Anybody ever heard of that? It's actual faith that believes no matter what it looks like or feels like. He and his men are his people, spoken of here. Thy blessing be upon your people. So David is not worried. And he shouldn't be because you know what? After, after this situation, very shortly, Solomon is hung on a tree. The enemy is dead. And the king returns because he's the chosen one to be king. And all of the uprisings in the world will never change that. And they'll never change it in God's heart. And you know, and I'll, I'll end with this, and I'm shutting my Bible. You know where David learned that? You want to know where he learned that? I'll tell you where he learned it. He learned it when he was anointed king at like 16 years old. And Saul was the guy who sat on the throne. And he had to believe in spite of everything that was going on, in spite of all the authority, in spite of all the power that Saul had, God said, and I'm sure this went over in David's mind over and over, God said, you're king. He probably had to talk to himself and say, God anointed you. You didn't do this. You didn't hunt down the Lord. You didn't ask for this. So be king. Be kingly even when you're not in the position. Be kingly in the way you carry yourself. And did, did David do that for the most part? He really did. Be kingly. And if nobody sees that you're king, God sees that you're king. If nobody gets it, you got it. And that glorified God. And you stood with him in it. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, we just ask you to bless your word and bless our hearts and Keep us tender to you, and may these things not just be passing teachings. God, I, I know that some will go through these things, maybe all. And I so long and ask for you, for you to please let it sink into them and save them, Lord, from their own flesh and save them from their own fears and keep them kingly by the life of Christ within holding on to the Lord, not just in the doctrine and the teaching, but in the spirit in which they carry themselves. Father, grant it in Jesus' name. Amen. This time we're actually really, truly dismissed.